I'm here with a Grit TV regular, Leo Girard, International President of the United Steelworkers of America. He's joined today by Nick Gateau. Nick is a titanium worker who is an up-and-comer in the union. We're going to talk about the present and the future and how we get from a less good place to a better one. Let's start with a little history, Leo. Um, we talk a lot about work in America. I don't think most people know what a steel worker member, what his job or her job is like. Talk about your job when you were, was it a, a nickel? nickel I, I, wor I worked in a nickel smelter. Uh, what did you do every day? When I was a kid growing up, the town that I grew up in because of the industry that was there was considered the most polluted place in North America. The astronauts came to practice a moon landing there because there were no trees left. Uh, the union that I'm proud to lead now and proud to serve uh, decided that we had to clean that up. So if you say what was work like then, it was dangerous, it was more dirty, it was unrewarding, it was very difficult. But because of the union and because of the commitment that we made to the community, to the environment and to our members, that place has now won awards from all around the world for the, what's called the re-greening. Uh, the workplace is now cleaner and safer. We haven't had a fatality in that smelter in years and years and years, thank goodness. When I was a kid, we had two or three a year. Yeah. What did the union do that turned that picture around? We bargained tough. We bargained those things into the collective agreement. We got involved with the community. We created Community Alliance for a Clean Environment. We were doing that in the 60s and, and taking that. And we came to realize that we weren't able to win these struggles in that community by ourselves. We needed to build Community Alliances. We helped elect the mayor. We helped elect people on city council. And we helped create a new climate for, for cooperation. Talk a bit, Nick, about how your work day is spent. What's it like and is it different from your parents, your father, grandfather? I work at a titanium foundry. Um, it's still pretty dangerous. Um, the difference is, is that we have the right to speak up. Um, the workers are very, uh, the workers actually fight back. If we see a safety issue, we have the power um, with the United Steel Workers to actually speak up. Um, the thing that I am noticing now is though is that we are kind of going back in time. We're working longer days, um, we're giving up some of the things that, that the union fought for all these years. And a lot of it's because we have layoffs and the layoffs are making the workers work harder, work longer. And, uh, but I work in a very safe place now uh, and workers have the right to speak up and, and we do that often and management listens. So what are the challenges primary challenges that you think you're facing, Leo, in your movement? I think back to in 1986, our chief economist in the steelworkers named Jim Smith, he said, you know, there's a battle going on in this country and no one's paying attention. One of the young guys said, what's that? He said, there's a battle going on between the people who make money by manipulating paper and manipulating money and the people who make money by making things. If the people who make money by making things lose, we're in deep trouble. So one of the things that's a problem now for the labor movement is the ultimate power of the financial community that controls so much in the nation's wealth, that have fed the 1% at the top, have tried to drive down living standards. They've used the political power they can buy to try and influence the political system. That's the reason workers' wages aren't climbing while the top 10% have had a 40% increase in their income since 2009. That imbalance can't survive. You can't sustain a democracy when you got 80% of the people whose living standard is falling, 15% whose living standard is stagnant, and 5% whose living standard is exploding in the upper, upper echelons. So that's the challenge, and I think we're moving in the right direction now at the AFL-CIO convention of bringing everybody together. How do you feel, Nick, when you see the news at night and it talks about the massive new profits going to a few on Wall Street, or how well uh, the economy is rebounding because well, that Dow Jones index is going up and up and up. What I see with young workers is that we're actually starting to get angry. Um, and we're starting to think about where we spend our money and make sure that we buy American-made products to make sure that we give back to the community. So my family is very proactive when it comes to where we spend our money. Uh, and I believe most of the people at my mill, you know, we start we're more and more every day we start thinking about where we're spending our money. If it's local, if it's made in America, you know, we're willing to spend a little bit more money to get it. 
And you've started thinking at the union level, Leo, about how we actually make companies, how we create workplaces, and some new ways to structure that employer-employee relationship. You're even talking co-ops. Talk about that. Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, certainly 2008 proved to us is the uh, system of corporate capitalism is not working for the average person and that uh, we need to find alternatives. And that doesn't mean we'll re refigure the world in, in, in you know, 90 days. One of the alternatives we looked at is the Mondragon. Mondragon is the largest worker co-op in the world. It works out of the Basque region of Spain. They have 100,000 members and it's a cooperative. And, and they share the profits, they decide how much the boss is gonna get made, they do all that. And they're very, very successful. So we've done an alliance with them so that they could teach us then we've gone out into the communities and looked for sort of co-ops that we could create using the Mondragon model. We've now got two that are underway. It's going to take a while, but we're exploring new ways of doing it. Uh, also, when we go into negotiations, we now negotiate that we want a seat on the board in some of these companies. Not that we're going to change the board, but we're not going to get surprised either. But the real base reality is we need to build a movement. We need to build a movement of all people who share common values and to do that with the labor movement, whether it's people of color, whether it's women's movement, environmental movement, anti-poverty movement, all of the various movements that share our values. We need to come together and understand they're attacking us all. They're not, and if they do us individually, we'll all die individually. If they do us collectively, we'll win. How do you address differences when they come up? And there are differences here at the AFL-CIO convention. Among others, there's the difference between the environmentalists, the Sierra Club is here, and some of the steel workers and the construction workers who have in the past felt, well, those environmentalists are going to ruin my well, job. It's not a good environment or good jobs. It's not one or the other. Because in the long run, if you try to do one or the other, you'll have neither. The fact is the matter, it's going to be both. We need to move to a cleaner environment. We need to move to more sustainable manufacturing techniques. We need to eventually uh, grow out of and have more renewable energy. If, if you look at the issue of uh, carbon emissions, most people don't realize they, where, the, where the most carbon emissions come from. They come from buildings. 60% uh, of the schools in America are more than 50 years old. Two and a half million miles of, of uh, natural gas pipelines in America are more than 60 years old. In Pittsburgh, we've got still water pipes that are made of wood that in the wintertime they'll freeze and break and burst and flood the downtown. So those things, if we do them right, is an is a alliance between the environmental movement, the labor movement, the various unions. We'll clean up the environment and we'll create good jobs. What was your, you mentioned the word pipeline. What was the union's position on the Keystone Pipeline? Uh, our position is that it ought to be made, and it ought to be made with steel that's come from America and Canada if it's coming through there. And if it's not, it shouldn't be made. Uh, now, the fact of the matter is, it's not about the pipeline. It's about whether or not we're going to have fossil fuels. And the reality is that We've got to have a campaign that's going to uh, have more renewable energy. We need to have a campaign that's going to have cleaner energy. We've got to have a campaign that's going to create jobs. There's way more jobs if we can build a renewable energy energy infrastructure. There's way more jobs if we can uh, bring our public buildings up to current standards. The average public building in America is more than 75 years old. So you would com you would collaborate with work with, for example, the indigenous groups, Absolutely. Like Idle No More, and the others who were opposing the pipeline, but calling for development of wind energy. Absolutely, solar? absolutely, and in fact, we our union started to do that surprisingly 30 years ago, uh, and and something that I'm personally proud of that I haven't been able to accomplish yet in the U.S. When I was uh, the regional director in Canada. We signed collective agreements with the Aboriginal people that protected their Aboriginal rights, protected their fishing and hunting rights, protected their land. We did all of those things because there was going to be a mine on their property. It was their property, it was their mine. We wanted to represent them and we did it. Mm -hmm. So we can work with anyone. What's the future as you see it? Do you think you'll still be working in the titanium smelting in 10 years, 20 years? Would you want your kids to go into this industry? I, I believe that uh I probably will be working there in 20 years. Um, do I want my kids to go into that industry? Probably not. I'd rather them uh, go get an education and, and do something, maybe not working with their hands. But uh, I, I really enjoy working there. I enjoy the community I live in. 
I believe that um, working there we make a stronger community. It's by far uh, the best paying job in the town I live in. And Where is that? It's in Albany, Oregon. Um, and by far the steel workers care about that community a lot and we give back to that community and, and working in a place that allows you to actually have a living wage um, where I can have four kids and a wife and uh, a happy family. Um, you see a future for yourself in the union? I do. Um, I have the United Steelworkers tattooed on my arm. It is something that I truly believe in. Every time I put on a union shirt and get ready to go to a union meeting, my kids, all of them, put on their union gear and they want to come. They know that their daddy fights for working families, and we all believe in that. Is his job in danger, do you think? You're running for his position? One day, he's going <laughs> to let me take it. <laughs> well, I believe the two of you are capable of really incredible things, so thank you for your work. Pleasure to be here, and thank you for your work.